Well, says I'm live. That's good. I'm going to go ahead and hang out for a few minutes and drink some coffee, wait for some people to join. <sighs> coffee. Coffee at noon. It's good times. Let me know if you guys can hear my audio and see my picture okay. I'm still getting used to this live stream fun. Um, today is just going to be a relaxed Q&A. Talk about some tools. Talk about business. Talk about what's next, 2021. Uh, kind of whatever. So it's a coffee with Chris. Feel free to feel free, feel free, feel free coffee. Feel free to drop a comment in the comments. Um, that's the whole point of this today is to take your questions and talk and just get to know everybody. Because normally I live stream off of Instagram. And this is the first kind of time other than yesterday, live streaming straight to YouTube and Facebook. So hope to do this a little bit more often and uh, see how it goes. Um, as I get more advanced with all the uh, camera stuff, I'll be able to uh, move you guys around the shop and show you different processes, um, do some projects together and, and that kind of thing. So not just jewelry though sometimes we're going to do lapidary uh i do a lot of machining inventions that kind of thing in fact this guy up here my lighting bracket this guy hey is a a bracket that i made last night using the orion welder so there'll be all sorts of fun stuff all sorts of great bits and pieces for uh for us to talk about, share, all that. Um, I do have a layering of tools down here that uh, I offer through the Forge, um, and then a couple of them that uh, Pepe Tools sells for me. So we can talk about those. We can uh, talk about whatever. So here I am. Grab a cup of coffee, chill. Take YouTube video suggestions. That's another good thing to do right about now. Um, yeah. Let's see. What do we have sitting around here we can talk about? Well, let's just start off with the Lime Punch Forge line of tools. Um, right out of the bag, first one. So all of my products come usually in a nice bag with the stamping with my logo on it. And this one happens to be your purple punchers. So these guys are purple heart dowels that I have put together in a little kit for forming metal. Now, let me see if I think this picture here has a, that flower was actually formed with one of the purple punchers. So what these do is allow you to uh, form metal without ruining texture on the other side of the metal. So if you're making flowers, you're making the, oh, I don't think I have anything sitting around my desk. But if you're making stuff like that with texture already on it, the purple punches are a great tool to add to your arsenal of tools. Um, they come in a pack of five for $12. Put those away. These guys, these guys are up for sale. And let's see what we got next. The uh, the next one is kind of uh, kind of fun. So this is the Lion's Claw original. It comes with five washers on there. The washers aid in downward force for soldering, and you can vary that weight by removing the washers all the way down to the bottom. 
and having no weight. Now, the nice thing about this one compared to the original, original version one is that this one now has a titanium uh, tip. So you can move it around. You can anneal it. The first generation lion's claws were made with a, uh, a spring steel. And the titanium allows for a much better uh, heat distribution for whatever you're soldering. So basically, it sets on the ground, sets on your soldering platform, and then you can bend your tip to hold down what you want to hold down. So if any of you guys watching have one of these, throw it in the comments. I'd love to hear how it's working for you. But yeah. So once this kicked off, I had uh, Bench Tool Junkies order, I think, 240 of these things. And they went out in a Bench Tool Junkie box, which was just super cool to have an involvement with uh, Stephanie and Carrie when they were still doing their bench tool junkie stuff. And uh, I met them in Tucson earlier in the year. I came out with this and they said, hey, let's put it in our box. So that was kind of a, a fun thing to uh, have. Let me move back to here. All right, good. Um, so yeah, these guys, these guys are at uh, limepunchforge.com as well. I think I have them for 45 right now. Put this guy back because, yeah, it's also for sale. You guys are oddly quiet in those comments. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. What do you guys think of a question? So next up, after the Lion's Claw Gold, or excuse me, the Lion's Claw Original, I came up with the Lion's Claw Gold. And just so happens that I grabbed a, maybe I did. Oh, oh. <laughs> when I was preparing this, I grabbed two originals. But that's okay, because I have my other gold sitting right here. Carrie, watch Francesca use one yesterday on a video and from November. Looks great. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the uh, Lion's Claw gold. This one has been used and I'm not going to say abused, but it's definitely been used. And what happens with most base metals is that they uh, they get a little bit uh, patinaed. The front portion of this, the steel uh, collar, it's got a little bit of a little bit of rust on it, but that's okay. Uh, you're going to be getting this quenched. You're going to be putting it in water. You're going to be heating it up and that's okay. So if these break, if they go bad, anything like that, these are these are something that I can I can send out and replace. But the collar itself coincides with a hole in the shaft and in the tip. And what that allows me to do is slide this collar on. and insert different tooling. So for example, this one is, uh, uh, it's, looks like it's steel, but since we're here, we're gonna cut some, uh, little, some titanium off. Snippies. Huh? Oh, hey, let's see. Paula, how are you? So, the nice thing about the Lion's Claw Gold is that it, uh, it comes with an entire round coil of titanium. So you have lots of options for there. It comes with a couple steel tips, and uh, so you can interchange them out. You can buy your own stainless wire. You can use that. You can I can uh, provide you with more titanium wire, obviously. Yeah small price for like a refill or something like that. I don't have those on my website, but feel free to reach out. I've I got no problem doing refills for you guys if you're using them up. The uh, So I have my titanium wire and I'm dropping it. What I'm going to end up doing is taking that titanium wire, inserting it into my lens cloth. Make sure I got my screw out of the way. That's the other thing. You got to make sure your screws retracted otherwise it's not going to fit in there 
And now you have a tip on there. Obviously, this one is way too long. But I'll give you an idea of what we can do with this. So I have the tip just like the other one. The gold comes from the brass that I use as the uh, neck for the tool. Still has the five washers for added weight. And what it does is it allows you to have a little heavier heft, some heftage for uh, holding your pieces down. But the other thing it does is just so happens I don't have them right here. That'll work. I can round or bend the tip of my claw to kind of whatever shape I want. And the fun part of that is, let's see, I'm going to take this one out real fast and I'm going to go ahead and find my snipping. I'm going to take one of the pieces of wire, I'm going to bend it in half-ish. I'm going to insert it into my lion's claw. Maybe. This is one of my originals, so it's not has the same specs as the other ones. But the one that you get, it's going to have a little bigger opening so that you can insert that wire in and then bend it over. So you have kind of a, uh, a loop like that. And you can either use that to push down on a bezel while you solder on your back plate. Or fun thing is you can actually turn your lion's claw over and lay it flat and rest something on here to solder. So you don't have to use it neck down like this. You can tip it up and you can create a platform to solder underneath. And these are titanium, so they hold up to heat. Um, Gordo says, what makes the parallel pliers you just used? Uh, who makes, I'm guessing, uh, these ones are made by Wubbers. Uh, my friends at Wubbers are amazing. They, uh, I met them in Tucson this last year too. Uh, since then, we've talked on and off. And uh, I got some of their awesome hammers over here next to my frets hammers. And honestly, I use my Wubbers probably more than I do my frets hammers. Um, but these parallel pliers are made by Wubbers. So the other thing that you can do with your uh, lion's claw uh, any advice on how to control the engraver adapter, just the foot pedal? Also, any tips on sharpening engraver for the first time? That is a great question, and I think after I get done with this, uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about that. Absolutely. So you have basically a wire in there that you can bend around to either press and hold on to or attach to anything that your mind can come up with as a holding technique. So um, that, and I actually, I love uh, peanut butter. It's a comment there, the engraving adapter. Um, so controllability. So real quick question before I move on to um, my advice is when, how good are you able to control your foot pedal so that it only does like maybe one click at a time or two clicks very slowly like click 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 um what i would recommend is just getting used to just very lightly pressing that foot hold and i'm going to move this guy over here to that desk and let me adjust my screen here so i can take your comments with me moment please let's undo here scroll down there we go all right so let me bring you guys over here this is the nice thing about being able to take move my camera and then 
say hi. So I'm going to stand right over here where you guys can see me. I have you on camera right behind me here, right next to me. And I'm going to grab one of my hammer hand pieces. This one basically has uh, an engraver adapter already in it. And I'm going to place it in my flex shaft. So to turn this on, I'll take my tip, I'll press, I'll lay it down on top, and then I'll turn on my, just barely hit my foot pedal to uh, move it into place, and then I'll click it in. So what you're looking for, for controllability, is your ability to go and do something like this. Do you see how, uh, I'll move down here so I can see your comments. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm practicing only a couple clicks here and there. You guys can hear that. Let me move back over and read a comment here. This screen is a little too small for me to see, so uh, unhook you guys, move you back over to the other computer. Um, so the basically what you're going to be looking to do is learning to adjust your what? I'm not over there still. I'm over here. Hey. So what you're looking to do is uh, learn to vary how much pressure you have on the pedal. Um, some of the hardest things for people to learn is that control, how much you press, how much you let off. Um, the main thing with the foot pedal compared to the dial rheostat is that you don't want to take your engraving adapter too fast. If you take it too fast, and you run a, excuse me, a risk of ruining it. And you don't want to do that because, you know, you paid money for the hammer hand piece. You want to make sure that you, you know, take care of your stuff. So um, that's the advice on foot pedal. I don't know if that helps out or, or not. Um, it's kind of practice. You want to make sure you're going slow enough that you're able to kind of control taps that you hear audibly and the percussions that go into the engraver. But you also want to be able to ramp up and ramp down in well being in control of it. Um, that's kind of the hard part for some people. Now for uh, engravers. Peanut butter, let me know whether or not that made any uh, any sense. So, gravers, got my protractor here. And we got this guy. Let's make the screen bigger so I can see everybody. There we go. Awesome. Good. So gravers, I, this is, this is people's most unfavorite part of graving to begin with, uh, is you want to be able to get a tool and then just go straight in and use it and be good at it. Um, I found in my own experience and uh, the experiences of others is that engraving especially is one of those harder skills to just get pick up and then immediately be good at it. It just takes, a, it takes practice, just like anything else. Um, it takes practice to learn to use a computer. It takes practice to make a good cup of coffee, which that was, that was a good cup of coffee. So the one piece of advice I can give you for sharpening gravers is geometry. Simple geometry is you want about a 45 degree bevel on your engraver. This is simplest 
absolutely simplest I can bring it. There are more complex versions of sharpening gravers, but I'm giving you simple. First, worry about getting a nice 45 degree angle on your graver. So here I have a graver. I'm gonna come down here. I'm gonna lay it, I'll move you guys down. Let's do that. We can move this stuff out of the way. Maybe zoom in a little bit. See what we can do to help you guys out. Get that out of the way. I don't want to zoom on that. All right. So what I'm going to do with this guy is I'm going to lay him so that his uh, it's laying on the face. And then I'm going to take my protractor. And I need to get a new protractor because this one does not do what I want it to do. So I'm going to lay basically my graver. And what you'll end up seeing is that angle that's on the graver right now is 45 degrees. So you're going to want to maintain that 45 degree angle. That's the, that's the big thing to begin with. Then you're going to want to take that face and see if I can zoom in on that face. Maybe let's see that face there. You really can't see any grind marks there. I can see a few from where I'm at, but when you get a new graver, you're going to see grind marks on that face. The most important thing I can tell you to start graving well is to remove those tool marks because they act like little tiny serrations. What you want is a nice smooth buttery cut and with serrations, with tool marks, any dings, dents, anything like that, you're going to have a hard time getting a nice smooth cut. So, what I would recommend is take a look at any of the tools that you have that you're going to engrave with and make sure that all of those tool marks are removed. And you can do that in a couple different ways. You can lay down some sandpaper, like, I don't know, 400 grit, and then take your graver. And so here's my tip. I'm going to put the tip down. I'm going to put it down kind of flat, and I'm going to rotate the graver up until it bottoms and I can feel that it's flat. So here I'm moving it up and right there I can feel that I'm flat. So then I'm gonna draw, move over so you see a little bit more. I'm gonna draw away from the tip. So I'm not sharpening the sandpaper into, or the uh, graver into the sandpaper, I'm pulling it away, pulling it away from the tip. So what that does is it saves your sandpaper from getting a tip in it, and then it starts to shave or, uh, sand that down. Same thing could be done with a uh, like a nice sharpening stone. Um, I personally love sharpening stones. I have a bunch of them, but they can be relatively expensive, and not everyone has those. Um, let me see if I can find another graver here. I think they're all over in my block. But here's another. This one has that tip in there. And this is a, a factory one, a stock one that comes with it. And what I ended up doing was taking the profile of the top portion of the graver and moving this down by grinding it, reducing the overall width of that graver. That does a couple things. One, it makes this face smaller, which means you have less material to remove when you're engraving or trying to sharpen your graver. So you have this amount of material removed, and now you don't have to sharpen that portion of the square. It changes the geometry up here into being more of a triangle versus a, a diamond shape. So doing that and when you do that you make sure to keep this nice and cool you don't want to overheat it you don't want to have temper colors coming in there otherwise you're going to what's up yako 
Otherwise, you're going to uh, end up having some problems with your uh, it, it maintaining its edge. Anytime you have um, tempering, or like a tempered piece of tool steel or something like this, and you heat it up so it turns uh, like purple and blue, you're removing the temper from the steel and it's not going to hold its edge as well. So you want to make sure that this is nice and cool. You're only grinding a little bit at once and then cooling it and grinding a little bit and cooling it. But the other thing I can recommend for gravers is if you're making, trying to sharpen your own and you want maybe a smaller one, remove some of the material that you're not going to be using for the graver. So I basically removed all the way down to make this a triangle. Then what I ended up doing is polishing that face. So polish that face so it's nice and smooth. And then once that's done, I'm going to want to take care to remove burrs from any portion of this graver because little burrs are going to dig in to the little fine engraving lines that you're going to be making. And you don't want that. Remember, uh, tool marks and burrs are kind of like serrations on a knife. Um, if they're <coughs> used for the wrong thing, they can dig in and, and actually think think of what it looks like when you cut something with a serrated knife versus a smooth, finely polished chef's knife. The edge that it leaves behind is going to be, yeah, let's see. We're going to over-exaggerate here using this. All right, so if I cut with a with a like a nice kitchen knife, that's supposed to be a kitchen knife. Don't hate me. Um, versus a a knife with serrations, what I'm going to end up seeing is that my cut, my two pieces of my cut, are going to be jagged as they move down, whereas a nice slice, you're going to have these nice and smooth. Same thing is true when you um, use a graver. If your faces aren't smooth and they're jagged, you're going to get a jagged response. If your faces are smooth, you're going to get a nice smooth grave. Here, not good. Tool marks, scratches, dents, not good nice and sharp tools always the best so let's see the next thing since we're not done talking about gravers yet and this is kind of a, a nerd topic for me is i have this guy and i've sharpened my face right here what i'm going to want to do is just kind of take the burrs off the heel of the graver the heel of the graver are the bottom parts of the cutting face. So let me try and get you guys on camera here. So grab my pointer, my fingers out of the way. So I have my graver right here and right here. This face is my graving face. Now, if I turn it upside down, I have those same faces here and here. What I'm going to want to do is just slightly polish, not cut, not grind, but polish the bottom edges of that cutter, of that graver. And what that's going to do is provide you a little bit of um, kind of depth of cut. Some They call that a, uh, I just said it out loud. Now I can't think of it. Your heel. What that does is just kind of gives you a much smoother slide into your metal. It gives you an overall better cut, and it improves that angle for what you're doing. Um, yeah, I think what you're talking about, Larry, is probably one of these, a crocker jig. And what this does is, let's see... Find my, uh, take this out real fast. Uh, 
Let's find a, an Allen wrench. Or this guy. <laughs> So the way this jig works is that it provides you a fixed way to sharpen your graver because it has this open uh, kind of little bird's mouth there. I'm going to open this up. I'm going to place my graver in. And then I'm going to tighten it back down. Now, right now, it doesn't matter how it goes in, as long as it's in there nice and tight. So what that does is allows me to zoom out a little bit. It allows me to then establish that angle that I'm working on with a bunch of adjustability. So I'm... Right there's about 45, and so I'll tighten that down. Then, oh, you're welcome. Absolutely. Um, so I'll tighten that down, and then now I can basically take this bottom piece here, and it slides nice back and forth. Now here, you would place your stone, and if you had a stone up higher here, you would need to readjust your angle so that your graver was laying flat on that stone at the right angle, tighten it back down, and then you're able to use the crocker jig to just slowly hone that angle in. Now, once you get done with that one angle and you want to grind something else, you take a different adjustability here and you can move the graver to a different position without taking it out of your tool depending on which angle you want to you want to look at now the bad thing about these jigs is that you have to kind of eye or measure exactly where you're at because it doesn't have any exact dimensions on it for where you're at and where your graver is uh <coughs> is um you know indexed to so you have to pay attention to where you want to cut, how you're cutting, and all that if you want to use one of these guys. I do use it, but I learned hand sharpening uh, from my grandfather, and I absolutely love hand sharpening. I'm, I've gotten decent at knowing what angle is what uh, when I'm sharpening a knife or a graver or something else like that. So. It all depends on you. There are a lot of fun tools out there to help you uh, figure out what you're doing. And I will tell you from experience that a sharp graver in an engraving adapter is fun magic because you can do all sorts of different things with it. And you don't have to spend a bunch of money to uh, buy a thousand dollar graving setup. The other thing that you can do with it is texture. So move back over here. So I have here, let me zoom back in. I have here a burr. You guys can see that or not. So this burr has this. Where's my white paper? There it is. So this burr has little line serrations in it. This is a dental burr. Um, you can buy these from Rio, um, but they have straight lines versus a circular tooth pattern. These chucked up in an, an engraving adapter does really fun basket weave patterns just by using it like a lining tool. So you stick it in and then just use lines. And it's got several teeth on them depending on the size that you have and what that allows you to do is just index a line move to the next one index a line and then you can do like cross hatching that looks really awesome um same thing is true with here's a larger one i 
know if you guys can see that. I know cameras are fun. But that allows you a different tool in your engraving adapter to uh, just do something different. Now, the other nice thing about these is that if you have a uh, one eighth inch or two millimeter square or round rod, it'll go in here and it'll tighten down onto it. You can make your own texturing tools to go into this. And what that allows you to do is um, right now, if you go and uh, buy tips, pre-made tips, they can get kind of spendy. You can take and make your own, whether it's a cross hatch or a rounded setting type thing, um, you make your own. So that's the other cool part of that. You don't have to just use it for engraving. Or coffee. You can use it for texturing. You can use it for a lot of different things. So you get these through uh, Pepe Tools. If you go to the top of the comments, um, I stuck my affiliate link in there. It's uh, pepetools.com question mark AFF equals one four. Um, uh, thank you. Could have a quick look at a tool you agree with. You're welcome. Um, so that's basically uh, that's basically what this guy this guy does. It takes practice. Um, basically, has a you know you, you got to get used to sharpening. You got to get used to using a new tool. It can be very effective, and it can be a great piece of your uh, your tool arsenal. But just like anything else, it takes practice. So. If there are any other questions about that please let me know uh, i'm here for that that's the whole reason i'm here today it's just to answer questions i also since we're talking about the engraving adapters is i have a new tool line coming out in the beginning of the year and it's going to be based around uh basically <laughs> rescued uh rescued stuff <laughs> so reused or repurposed uh doorknobs or excuse me, drawer pulls that I have built into being tools. This one happens to be uh, an engraving adapter hand tool. So if you wanted to use the engraving adapter as a hand graver, you could. So these aren't anywhere online at the moment, but I wanted to try making one to see whether or not it would work whether or not i liked it um and this has turned out to be really really handy the old drawer pull made out of brass so it's nice and heft and it allows you to use the engraving adapter outside of the hammer hand piece so that's one thing i'm working on the other along the same lines is using uh, vintage brass doorknobs to do burnishing tools. So this one's a steel burnisher, tool steel burnisher. It's got nice old doorknob or drawer pull on there, uh, and it's nice and solid. So I'm going to be having a couple different uh, of these type of tools available come beginning of the year and allow for, uh, you know, custom. I'll make probably brass burnishers. I want to make steel burnishers. And then I'd like to do something with uh, the engraving adapters. So we got those coming beginning of the year. And I'm hoping this one's on the market right now and on the website. This is the Angry Hedgehog. So the Angry Hedgehog is a solder pick. So it's a hand forged solder pick. The tip is titanium. The handle here is made from steel and it is forged. And what it allows you to do is a couple different things. I put it down and it doesn't roll. It doesn't roll off your bench. And that's one of the things that I hate about some of mine 
uh, some of the ones that I have is that I put it down and it would roll off my bench and then it'd fall on the ground and then I'd have to crawl around looking for it. So the hand forged allowed me to place kind of a flat edge so it wouldn't roll. And then the other part is science. So titanium has a, uh, a high heat conductivity, which means it attracts heat really, really well. And it maintains it really, really well. It also resists it really well. So it has a melting temperature of like, I think it's over three, three or over 35,000 degrees. There, excuse me, 3,500 degrees. Um, titanium. So it's nice and heat resistant. But one of the things I've noticed with other solder picks is that if the handle is aluminum, aluminum also conducts heat and electricity very well. So I made my handle out of steel. Um, steel does not have the same uh, heat transfer as um, aluminum or some of the other materials, which means any of the heat that goes through the titanium and then hits the steel is absorbed and dissipated so you're probably not going to feel this heat up at all the other thing is that it is a substantial tool it's heavy not so heavy that you need like a you know a back brace to lift it off the ground but it's it has some nice heft to it and the reason for that is, is that especially when you're bracing on something or you want to solder something i want to be accurate and I don't want the tool in my hand to feel like it's not there. I want to be able to know it's there. It has nice balance too. So I can rest it on my hand and I can just tip, bring it back here. So I don't have any grip on this at all. It's just resting on my palm of my hand and I'm using the side of my palm to rotate the tip down. I have shaky hands. And this has helped with my shaking quite a bit. It allows me to rest my hand on something and then move it using my, the side of my palm as a, uh, another stabilization point. So this is the Angry Hedgehog. It is also on the website currently. I think I have five left. It means I, that, What that means is I have to make more. So these guys have been really, really fun. Angry hedgehogs. Now, let's see. I have any other questions right now before I move on to, uh, oh, we can move on to haymakers. So if I have any, yeah, algebra. Heat conductivity, heat loss, Newton values, all that kind of fun science stuff. Let's move camera back up. All right. So the next thing we'll probably end up doing is talking about the haymaker saw. So this is not a production haymaker. I will say that. So it is one of the originals that we created to test the theory of the haymaker. And I zoomed out all the way. I don't think I am. I was a little, a little too close. So um, the one I made for me actually has a brass claw foot handle on it. Um, it is heavy to the, to the feel, but as soon as it's in your hand, it's balanced and I designed this one like a sword because I used to do a lot of blacksmithing still kind of do and I wanted to have a saw that had the balance of a sword a long sword and you can see I can fight off ninjas with my haymaker just because it's balanced like a sword the concept of having it balanced like a sword uh, is translated into production model. And that's why we're able to have that nice balance of the haymaker saw. 
because we have our weight distribution up here. Awesome. And then we have our counterbalance handle. That means that wherever I move, the saw moves with me. So advantages to that. I found that with other saw frames and I'm, I'm not going to actually, you know what I am. I'm going to do it one moment, please. And you might hate me for it, but I'm going to do it. Come ah, I'm back. All right. This has a five throat, which means the distance between here and here is about five inches. This has a five inch throat. This is a haymaker. Similar, somewhat similar in size, similar throat dimensions, but I'm going to go ahead and try and show you just by letting go of my hand where this saw's balance is. It's back there. And I could let it drop on the floor because I don't use this saw. But I'm not going to do it because I respect my tools. So saw is heavy on the back. Handle isn't counterbalanced. You have a lot of weight up top and not a lot of weight at the handle. So what I find in my research, my research papers, is that when people get fatigued, they end up following gravity. So as I get tired, my sawing starts to do this. And there's a reason why sawing at this angle and this angle isn't good proper. Because the more I tip the teeth, the more teeth are engaging that metal, the more I tip the teeth back, the more teeth are engaging the metal. I want to have at least two, 2.35 teeth engaging in the material at any one time. That's how you pick your saw blade. You want to make sure your saw teeth have at least two to two and a half to three teeth engaged per thickness of the metal. Now, I look at my saw blades and go, uh, that looks to be about a 16 gauge blade. No, there, there are charts to help you with that. There are charts that say for this gauge or thickness of metal, use this number saw blade. So you don't have to remember that. But what does happen is let's talk about science again. So if I have something thick, a brick, and I'm sawing, and I have those teeth engaging my saw cut, right? I should look at you guys. So I have those teeth engaging my saw cut. Now, if I tip my saw, I then create a triangle of sorts, and I have now more teeth touching that blade or touching the material than I did before. If I move it straight up, remember, shortest distance is a straight line. So I have those teeth, and then if I tip it down, I have more teeth engaging that material. You don't want that. You want to minimize that. So saw blades straight up and down now do professionals sometimes saw like this or saw like this yes do i sometimes do that yes however still doesn't make it right so with fatigue and weight you want to have your tools be comfortable right i know i do so if my saw, when I'm using it, wants to have a tendency of tipping back, this isn't going to be super comfortable to use. That's just me. However, now I have a similar weight saw that has that balance and allows me to maneuver the saw the way I needed to. When I get tired, it's not gonna to wanna to tip back or tip forward because its balance point is straight up and down. 
That's achieved through countermounts, technology used in swords, medieval swords, not so much ninja swords. But <clears throat> that's the one reason why we went with something like this. So we all had this huge input into the engineering into it goes into a saw. It wasn't just a, hey, let's make a saw and then vomit a saw. There was many, many hours, hours and days of engineering that went into this. And it's beautiful. So that is the Haymaker saw. Available through Pepe Tools. And you can use my affiliate link to uh, check that out. The, uh, at the very top of the chat there, there's a, a thing. So, if are there actually are there any other questions? Anything else you guys got um, about business, about lapidary, jewelry, tools? Um, what's next? I've got a uh, a new tool that I'm working on producing right now. It's not uh, it's not these guys. I ran cost analysis last night. Um, did some other stuff, but it, it should be fun and you should be able to use it in conjunction with some of the other tools that I have if it works out right. So um, I know a lot of people are probably going to be working now. So if you see this later on, then uh, yeah, send me a message, leave me a comment. Um, if you're watching from YouTube, there's a little red subscribe button down there. Go ahead and click that. And uh that way you know when I make a new video, maybe when I go live. If you're watching from Facebook, head over to YouTube. Hit me a subscribe if you like this kind of stuff. Um, doing so and using the affiliate links and the Amazon links that I have posted there helps support my family and the Lion Punch Forge. Um, I want to keep this going. This is my full-time job. So anything helps. Um, I do take custom jobs. I do take uh, custom orders for uh, tools and that kind of thing. Uh, new knobs and, you know, a little bit of everything. If you send me a message and have a question, I'm going to be very upfront and honest with you about, very candid about whether or not I can do something and I can't do something. And if I can't do it, I'm going to try and point you in a direction to somebody who can. I'm not, I'm not interested in trying to uh, pretend Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Don says, thank you for demonstrating uh, balance and tools. Let's see. Um, and it's, I find it really, really important that um, if we're going to be using the, the jeweler saw is the heart and soul of, of, of our bench, right? It's, it's what we, what we depend on a lot. Most people hate it. I don't. I like it. Especially I like it when you have something nice to be, you know, holding in your hand and something custom. Uh, speaking of custom, I'm going to start engravings. So watch out for that in the new year. Um, it's nice to have something that you reach for that you like to use, that you reach for that is a part of you, feels like a part of you. Your tools should not feel like shouldn't feel like cumbersome. They should be a part of you. Should feel like a part of you. Should like to hold it. You should like to use it. Good gravers, uh, burnishers, you should like to hold it, to have it in your hand, to use it, to have it feel like it's a part of you. So balance is extremely important when it comes to that. Balance, functionality, and beauty. Because you know, we make art. We want our tools to be art as well. That's why engraving on the frame is going to be awesome. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's pretty much uh, pretty much what I got. I thought I had something else. Did I have something else? Uh, Yako says, thank you. You're welcome, man. We'll talk to you soon. Um, Paula, always a pleasure. And yeah, did I have something? I think it was the engraving thing. I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm going to do my frame first. I've got to do a frame for my dad and my brother. And then after that, I should have the hang of it. And uh, I can maybe provide some, uh, maybe some roses or some scrolls or name 
on these guys. Yeah, good times. Appreciate you guys watching, and uh, we'll go ahead and end this here. Uh, message, contact the Forge if you have any ideas for live streams, videos, anything you want to see. Um, I'm going to be doing more of this. I really like this platform, especially when I got people engaging. Um, yeah, and it doesn't matter if I think there's like 15 people today, but that doesn't matter to me. It's, you know, dumb. it's just a number, right? So I may, I may be a certain age, but I feel like I'm way younger than that. You know, I feel it in the morning. All right. Oh, I remember these guys, scribes. I'm going to be recycling garage door springs and using and making them into uh, custom scribes, like blacksmith scribes. It's going to be awesome. And that's coming in the new year as well. So hope to see you guys there. Uh, check out lionpunchforge.com. Check out the Peppy Tool link. Uh, and uh, yeah, see you guys soon. Thanks for watching. End broadcast. Yes. See you later.